right, so he's Tim Johnson. I'm Chris Ruddick. We're here for Love of Code. We're bringing you current events, opinionated commentary, and witty banter around all things software. These episodes are powered by Prime3 Software, where we both work, and there we build well-crafted software to unlock the full potential of your business. So what's going on, Tim? Not a whole lot, man. Another day, another dollar. I'm at the office, and it Sounds like the city is starting to wake up again. So maybe we'll all get to go out and play again someday soon. Sure. Ooh, so share a little of the virus. Yeah, yeah. Until the next time. Yeah. So I had a thought and this is going to get real deep in the rabbit hole. I hope you're ready for this. Um, everybody's getting on board with work from home, which, you know, is a sad revelation because I've worked from home since before 2010 you were from home every day i have a theory that well let me ask when do you think it will be that we will begin to meet virtually not just like in a zoom conference or a skype or uh, any of these other platforms but like we put on the halo and the goggles and like we we meet Oh, that's that's next gen stuff. Like that would be awesome. Um, no, I got a deeper question than that next. So, um, what do you think of it? I that's that to me is I, I, that's probably something I could see Microsoft having that vision because they actually have like some augmented reality goggles called um, uh, Hololens that they're they're it almost looks like fighter pilot. Um, oh, like a heads goggles. up display. Yeah, but but they're like glasses and they're tilted, and what that does is allow the projector to shoot and use the like the parallax or whatever from the from the tilted glass to to, to let you you can still see through it because it's glass, but you get everything around you, and I'm just thinking, wow, from a dev perspective, if you could sit at your desk still programming stuff and just kind of turn and there's your coworker. Uh, you know, sitting next to you or whatever. And um, that, wow. I, I mean, I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, that would be, that would be spectacular. Um, so I have a theory that the future of work, and it may not even be in my lifetime, but the future of work will be all virtual. And I say that meaning, right? So <laughs> here we go. Are you ready? Buckle up. All the signals that your body interprets are effectively electric signals, right? Between your senses and your brain interpreting them, right? So all you have to do, I'm, I'm hyper simplifying it, so I'm, I'm making full use of the air quotes at the moment, but all you have to do is intercept those signals or introduce them as stimulus into the brain and the brain will interpret that as a real sensation, right? So that's how you see um, people who are, who are getting um, like robotic hands and arms are able to sense touch because they've introduced a signal into the nervous system that the brain is interpreting as a feeling. Yep. So my theory is that you're going to have one of those like enter the matrix like spikes and <laughs> plug in and then when you go to work you are experiencing work only through your senses not anything you're actually doing so like haptic feedback could be introduced electronically directly to your your brain you could feel like you're typing on a computer but you're doing it in a virtual environment yeah, that comes out on Tuesday, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's possible? Oh, I, yeah. I mean, uh, based on all that stuff you just said, I mean, yeah, that's that would be, I, I don't know. I mean, that would be so much more like the Matrix that you start to question, you know, Your reality. what reality really is. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different, um, you know, uh, uh, movies because I don't read books. But, I mean, like there was the... Uh, uh what's the latest movie that came out that talked about that um steven spielberg did something with it um ready player one. Oh yeah yeah um there's no plugs involved that was just headsets and and uh 
360 motion mats and things of that nature. I mean, that's that, probably the, the closer. Yeah, I was going to say that's that's the reality. more more realistic thing. Um, but I, well, I the, go ahead. What's the sci fi movie that blew your mind? For me, I written my first one was was The Matrix, where it was just like. Well, the Matrix what? always caught has always fascinated me. So my history behind the Matrix was um, we were I didn't know anything about it. I had never watched a preview, never saw a trailer, nothing. I was introduced to it by via a free um, free thing at, at school. It was, hey, do you want to watch a free movie? And we're like, sure. And we waited in line. And I kid you not, there was four of us. We were literally the last four into the movie theater. They closed the door behind and we were the last four that got in and it was a almost a standing room only like we didn't get to sit together like it was you know we were all over the movie theater um and just from from the very first scene i was just like <laughs> um yeah. just bl just completely just i i didn't know what i had seen uh, i mean i still like i mean, as soon as the movie became available for to purchase i purchased it and then watched it you know, probably once a day. Um, I mean, that, that movie just from, a like I, and I've seen behind the scenes now and everything else to, to see like they, what they extracted from like philosophy and stuff. I'm like, Whoa, this, this went way deeper than, than yeah. I had ever like visually. That's what drew me in was how do they do all those special effects and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's a, well, that lends itself, that whole movie, I don't know if it was before or after uh, the whole simulation theory that we're all living in a simulation. Have you heard that one? Yeah. I mean, it's basically the premise of of, of the movie, but uh, spoiler alert, I think Statute of Limitations is up. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll I will, um, <laughs> I saw the movie um, uh, on a bootleg. So <laughs> back back in the day, kids, when you um when you wanted to watch a movie and um didn't want to go to the movie theater you could uh, cruise around the streets of say dc somewhere and uh purchase movies on on a dvd that um had been recorded by somebody's shaky camcorder in a movie theater and um and you could buy like six of them for 20 bucks so a buddy of mine he 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 brought one to school and he was like, Hey, you want to watch this movie? And we watched it on his com computer monitor, which is also not a great audio visual experience, but, uh, it was, it was a terrible copy, but man, it just, it, it blew my mind. And most recently the, um, the show altered Car carbon, yeah. that one, that one, uh, also similarly, like really expanded my mind. I was like, wow, that's, that's some crazy. Kind. I'm glad there are smart people out there who are thinking this kind of stuff up. So it's super cool. Yeah, Altered Carbon, I think was a, it was a like at least season one. I liked it a lot. Um, I couldn't really. I, I've tried to get into season two twice now, and uh -oh. the fact that they don't have the same characters anymore, it's like uh, okay. But I mean, I almost Fits feel like that story, could. Yeah, but was, it's not. You know. Yeah. I, you're you're really. Um, and, and Anthony Mackie is a great actor and I've watched the whole season. It's, it's a good show. Uh, they, they, they expand the story more, but it's, um, yeah, just the, the whole premise of, of you don't, you only own your consciousness. You don't own your body is, is really cool. And that's how, like my, that's kind of where my theory started about, um, you know, plugging in virtually to work is they don't travel from planet to planet. Their consciousness travels from planet to planet, and then they just re-sleeve on a new planet and uh, interact, but they have their their body has not physically left where it started. Yeah, I mean, you got to solve a lot of stuff for that one. <laughs> mainly bit, main, mainly uh, pla interplanetary uh, travel, so that was a little, well, bit, a little bit further away. Yeah, I laugh, you know, details. I laugh at the uh, the self driving car um, because you know it, it, there's been so much talk about that for um, particularly in the past few years, and uh, you know I, I I I can't get basic things to work. I can't get my internet browser to 
to <laughs> I can't get my microphone to work my internet browser for 30 minutes and I'm like you want to you want these things to drive a car I think I think there's um I think we're a little bit further off than than the uh the futurists would have us believe um well yeah everything's built by humans so everything's uh fallible right now um well that's true um I mean I do I do appreciate you know from a from a you know to talk about the driving automation and stuff, you know, I, I appreciate Elon Musk's view of that saying that, you know, everyone wants to put LIDAR and everything else. And apparently that, that technology is really expensive. And I think from Musk's perspective that everything's going to get solved with cameras because as a human, you, you have two cameras and that's all you get. Well, if, right. they, if they can put 12 on a car, well, that seems like that would be better. Um, and so really the technology will gr grow as like AI grows, as, you know, those visual queuing systems grow, like you can still use, I mean, like the stupid webcam, I mean, you or I could just go glue a bunch of pro GoPros on your car, download the software and plug a couple things in and Bob's your uncle and we've got an autonomous car. Um, that seems more plausible than then you know hooking all these other systems up too um but i yeah i mean everything's everything's up for grabs um i the the, the working virtually I, I like i said you you you've uh i hadn't i hadn't considered like not actually you know everyone jokes like hey are you actually wearing pants well at that point who care are you even it's are you even out of bed none of that would matter yeah um so we would all be like the softest doughy people oh yeah <laughs> except our avatar in 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 the uh space that we're in those would be yeah you know uh, ripped ultra badass totally. yeah yeah straight out from the covers of like flex magazine yeah so that so to go back to one of our earlier podcasts we were talking about you know, your kids spending all their money on, on, uh, uh <laughs> Fortnite skins. Imagine that, imagine that as a thing that you got to buy now is oh, VR skins. An Armani suit for my avatar. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm a believer now. I thought it was silly <laughs> when they do it, but now, exactly. now I'm on board. Yep. So I read an article that I purposely held back from talking with you on because it's um, it, it, it just stirred rage inside of me, but I did want to bring it up while we're here. So uh, it came out this week that uh, C, the programming language C, has surpassed Java to become the number one programming language in all the land. Now, I question many, 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 many things about uh, the basis for this information, but I will give um, give full credit to the Tiobe Index, T-I-O-B-E Index, uh, who, who does a an annual report on this. And um, I've not reviewed their scientific method because I don't frankly care that much, but uh, they say that uh, the C programming language uh, has once again come into back into uh, the top spot, having been in the top spot in 1985, 1990, 2000, 2005, and 2015. So uh, like a bad dream, this thing keeps coming back around. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know whose commentary, if it's the author of this article, and we'll link to it in, uh, in the description of the broadcast. But... She says that um, the number one reason why C is coming back around is for um, the flexibility that it offers. Um, let's see. Embedded software languages such as C and C++ are gaining popularity because these are used in software for medical devices. That's fair. She cites Internet of Things as, as a potential driver for this. Um, but there was one sentence, and I'm trying to find it in real time. Uh, well, spoiler alert, these are all going to be rife for uh, 
uh, buffer overflows and, uh, and, and the yeah. likes of those. So uh, here it is. Another reason for C's popularity might be because of the language's use in embedded devices and its cross-platform programming. Yeah, because Java doesn't do any of that. Baloney. <laughs> we got to switch this to adult language channel, but baloney. So <laughs> here's the thing about C programming. If you've ever uh, had the misfortune to have to write a driver to adapt your C code to a software platform, you will know immediately that it is not built for cross-platform. These drivers for this language have to be written specifically yeah. to the hardware. Now, there are layers of abstraction and uh, that, that the community has developed to, you know, open source and take away that burden, but C is not a, a cross-platform language. It's very much a, plat a language written specific to a platform. And in that way, it does perform exceptionally well. And I've seen that in real time where um, I've written uh, true C code. I've even gotten down to writing assembly code and it outperforms some of the, you know, some of the languages that run within a runtime environment like a Java. But I still, I can't believe that there is that much demand for hardware programming at this day and age, especially as, tell me what you think. I mean, it feels like businesses, uh, uh, social platforms, you name it, are all coming into vogue in an online integrated way. Um, it feels like there's much, and you know, maybe we're biased because that's the kind of work that we do, but it feels like there's much more demand for a, a, I'll say a, a, a language that lends itself to a web centric view of the world than a language that is focused on the low level hardware view of the world. What do you think? Um, well, I mean, to, to, I mean, we know internet of things is coming on and I know, I mean, we know that Java is bloated from kind of the things it brings on. Um, and I think uh, Java has continually gotten performance um, improvements, you know, over time. But I just, man, with, with all the issues and stuff, and I think this goes back to, again, one of our earlier podcasts, we were talking about this Internet of Things and security models. Like, I, I got to think these are all going to be susceptible to these buffer overflows that are extremely easy to exploit. Uh, once you identify them, um, where languages like Go, like that's their primary tenet is to prevent all that stuff. So I'm like, uh, I don't know that that's a, it, maybe they just had a user pool or a developer pool that knew C and that's where they went. Um, I, I, I don't know. But I, I mean, again, it just goes back to what we talked about, was it last week where you know, program X is better than some other. And I, you know, is it, is, is C better? I mean, maybe, maybe for those implement those instances, but I mean, it's, uh, that's like saying cobalt's better at some things. I don't know. <laughs> I, feel well, I mean, in, in defense of, of, you know, this study, I think they are speaking to popularity. So, um, you know, better is subjective to the task, right? Yeah. So if, you know, some languages are better in some applications than others. Do you know what the I stats mean, are? I mean, did they win by like 0.01% or something? Uh, yeah, I can tell you. Um, C received a rating. Again, not sure what that rating means. I'd have to dig in deeper, which I won't. They received a rating of 17.07% and then Java, um, we received a rating of 16.28%. Uh, the next nearest entrant is is Python at 9.12, and then C++ at six and some change, and then C Sharp at four and a quarter, roughly. Um, but it shows that C was the biggest mover, and it almost increased 3% from last year. Um, 
and Java basically held still and Python is making some Python and C++. Uh, Python moved up uh, about one and a quarter and C++ moved down almost 2%. So, uh, which isn't surprising because I mean, C++ has been out of vogue for, oh gosh, 15 years now. Yeah. So um, it probably should be moving out of the top tier. I would say it should move out of the top 10 probably in the next five years, I would, if, if I was to guess. Um, JavaScript, interestingly, is holding a uh, really no change and, you know, rates sort of roughly 2.68%. So, I mean... Is TypeScript on the list? Comparatively, it's uh, pretty low. It's not. TypeScript is not. Wow. Um, I'll, I'll read them out to you, the top 10. C, Java, Python, C++, C Sharp, Visual Basic, ugh, <laughs> JavaScript, PHP, SQL, eh, and R. So I, I, I predict that R will be off the charts soon and Python will be whatever R is will, will consume most of that percentage jump. I bet by this time next year, um, Python's making a big push with all the data science and machine learning. Um, and then depending on how many people are going the route of, of a uh, serverless on AWS, you know, that that's going to be even more. So, yeah, I just, I, uh, it, so many, so many issues with this, but <laughs> I, I know mean, why I got your cackles up being a Java developer. You're like seeing that like, yeah. wait, what? Well, I mean, so I've, I've, I've programmed in a lot of different languages. Um, I, I keep coming back to Java one because, um, it's not perfect. I mean, there's no perfect programming language and I'm always looking for a better mousetrap. But my options, I, I like it for my options. And I say that in that uh, if I write a web application, how many, how many application servers can I deploy my code to? I've got a lot of options. Um, you know, how many integrated development environments can I work with? I've got a good number of options there. I, you know, it's, it's, it's open source-ish. <laughs> There's, that's a whole nother story. Uh, but I'll say the open Java as it is nowadays is, um, you know, is, is ripe for, um, com to be a community driven project. And I'm not locked into one particular ecosystem that somebody could, let's say, start charging a use fee for that bothers me. And, um, I don't. I don't want to be stuck in a, you must do it this one prescribed way because we said so. I like the, the flexibility of, you know, if, if this um, application infrastructure doesn't work for me, I have the option to switch to something else. And that's why I like Java. That's why I like um, everything they're doing with JavaScript and, and some of the modern JavaScript frameworks. Um, I, that's why I really like what they're doing with Python. Um, that's why I'm not as big a fan of C sharp. And I know there are plenty of purists out there who make an argument that you have lots of options, but in my experience, those are fewer and farther between than what I've seen in Java. So, um, you know, I feel like this whole thing is really clickbaity and maybe we bought into it whole hog, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, yeah, I just I just don't see it. So it's it's interesting. I'd be I'd be curious to see what um you know what the community at large has to say about it. I had several people send that article to me. I just saw the headline and just brushed it away. I'm like, whatever. Like I, I will not uh, be, I will not be tempted by this trash. Yeah, I'm uh, you know, I'm curious. Obviously, how they did their data collection. I was speculating that maybe it was like based on deployed platforms or, you know, something, but I just. And I do a similar thing. I, I spoke to this a while back, but I'll, I, I will periodically go out and just kind of investigate what languages are in vogue, you know, a, you know, maybe once or twice a year, just to kind of know, get a sense for, for where the industry is going, but I don't use any like hard and fast scientific method. It's really, 
you know, what, what's popular in Google searching, what's, um, what are the popular languages on like a GitHub or, um, you know, uh, what, what kind of questions are being asked on say stack overflow. So I, I kind of, my, my strategy is a little bit more crowdsourced than it is like true hard and fast numbers. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like I said, for, for what the article described that, I mean, it's a fair, it feels like a fair assessment that it's, you know, going in these medical devices. Um, and that are we building that many medical devices though? I mean, they say, you know, part of this could be an increase from COVID-19, but I, I don't think they're building that many new mousetraps. Well, so recently I had a conversation with the EDI standards folks and the guy was telling me that they have new standards that come out every year. And I said, well, well for hang on. what? Uh, for our unindoctrinated listening audience, uh, what's, what is EDI? Uh, what is it? Electronic data exchange, something like that. I forget what the name is, but it's a standards format that uh, text base that they send files. Um, and it's and why is, why is this thing important? This is horrible. No, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so they're they're transferring data back and forth between systems. So they got to have a common, common speak a common terminologies or something uh, in order to understand what you're what you're like from a logistics perspective. You know, I'm shipping this. We need. So it's an accepted protocol yeah. between industry. Yeah, partners. there's several different several different types. You know, there's some that are popular in the US, some that are popular in, in Europe and blah, blah, blah. Um, but so I was talking to this guy and asking what, what, why would why would a standard change? Um, you know, if, if I'm sending you, um, you know, an invoice, what could possibly change on an annual basis um, that you would have to update this standard? Um, and he said that most of the changes are in the health field and they're a, a large, uh, they, they use EDI uh, a lot, um, that every year they have new medical devices that come out and new, um, uh, I guess HIPAA, the, the whatever the government standard is to protect your, protect your information and stuff. Um, those those new regulations and new devices they they have to push out new standards every year um and i see, i think he said they have 400 members or 300 members and he said he said about 80 percent of them are in the medical hmm. somehow medical uh medical related um and then i think the bottom like 15 percent the next the next lowest is like 15 percent, which is banks and financial institutions, which also use this stuff. And you can imagine how important having a standard protocol to discuss or to, to share information about uh, stocks or bank accounts or mortgages or whatever that stuff is, that would be uh, important uh, as well. So I don't know what they're building as far as the, the medical field, but like I said, it's enough that they have to change the standard annually. Um, wow. to support these new devices. So um, maybe they're all coming up with their own version of the of your spike plug. <laughs> and we just don't know it yet. Lord willing. Gosh, yeah. that would be great. I would love to. I don't want to ram. I, I'm filled with needles. I don't want a, a spike in my no. head, man. <laughs> you know, uh, I got to think a USB-C be... plug would be benefit more, <laughs> more better. I don't wanna, I'll say I don't want to be the first one to uh, to – to sign up, you know, it's like the first person who, who signs up to try out a new vaccine or what have you. Like, yeah. I don't want, I want to be like, I want this thing to be kind of well sorted out by the time they, they start plugging me in. But that would be really, um, just to experience, uh, well, the uptake and download of information. Uh, you, man, you're sending me back down the rabbit hole. Look at this. <laughs> well, then you got Johnny Mnemonic. I don't know if you ever saw that, that movie. Did. Or like Lawnmower Man. Um, what else? There's all these, man. See, these are the movies that like shaped my primordial brain. And now I'm like, sign me up, plug me in. I'm ready to go. <laughs> well, it's, hard to, well in it's hard to think that, you know, that was, you know, they've been talking about that forever. And, you know, comparatively, we haven't come that far. 
but then you've got like Star Trek and stuff where they've kind of a like a utopia kind of you know type of society where it's not everybody trying to be in it for themselves but for everybody else like I wonder if how COVID would be perceived in Star Trek land uh, they got like a thing and they just like oh yeah you just need more you know quaylar shots and then <laughs> they like scan them and then they're good to go man yeah. that's how that's how it works so yeah so we are in the in the throes of this quarantine um i thought it would be a timely topic to bring up um how to find a software development job in the midst of a quarantine because um you know a lot of people they said unemployment in general is going to be hovering between 20 and 25 percent by the time all this is said and done or you know by the time all the states open back up uh and and software folks are really no different than any other job um in that you know we we we, we fall out of work we look for new jobs um you know, contracts dry up, that sort of thing. Um, and while I can say that no one alive has um, had to look for a computer programming job in the face of a global pandemic, um, I think it's a it's a it's a sizable challenge. And I'd love to hear uh, you know maybe talk through our thoughts on on how to how to cope with the current situation and, and some strategies for looking for work in this time in this industry. YouTube, man, everybody's got something on YouTube to increase your skills. I just saw, uh, I just saw an ad, was it yesterday or the day before? So it's kind of timely that you're talking about this. That was uh, Google is, has a, a electri some type of engineering class. That I believe they're offering for free. That you could go work for Google, um, yeah. in in some capacity. I mean, you just talked about, you know, the the increase of C. Um, so I mean, people are, you know, need these new medical devices or whatever. So I mean, there's constantly something changing. Um, I also saw a headline today that mentioned something about businesses are going to be changing how they do business and relying possibly less on humans because imagine if our society um you know the people that are doing the human tasks how much less of an impact we would have had had more of those things been automated um and so i mean all that automation needs to be built and programmed and um you know information just information has to be gotten out there you know i'm thinking of websites and things of that nature a lot of this stuff is super easy to get into um and i know a lot of people i know a lot of people that are like oh i couldn't possibly do that and it's like i think if they're teaching you know you mentioned in one of your other podcasts your your uh youngest is doing you know stitch or scratch or whatever it was i, I mean they some of these concepts are not difficult um, if you just, I mean, if you're motivated enough to do it, um, you know, just just having the drive to say, hey, I, I know I live in, or you know, area X and, you know, the, the local economy is decimated. Well, per our earlier conversation, working remote, you know, that, that's, you're only limited by your imagination um and then your and what your skill set is so i mean if you can increase your skill set skill shares another uh useful resource um you know they 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 teach classes and at the end of it you actually have something demonstrable that you can jump on so i mean yeah what are some free resources like that i mean is um you got skillshare um udemy is you know you pay for some of those Oh, those are all paid classes. Yeah, right? some of some of it's. I mean, depending on what the class is, but I, I imagine there's a lot. Cur even currently, right now, a lot of that stuff is free or really, really discounted, to the mm -hmm. point where you know you might spend ten dollars and get a whole class on, on say Angular or something. Um, yeah, and these classes are not like, you know, forty five minutes. These classes are like twelve hours of content. Yeah, I mean, it's. 
they they're they're intense is um is Khan Academy is that still a thing yep Khan Academy is free um my yeah. kids are on it every day um I often reference Khan Academy when they come to me with something where hey dad I don't understand this the science question or this um math question I don't lean on it too much for English or anything any of those things but I'm certain that those are are there and viable I mean they're very helpful for the the areas that I I I did you know struggle with or whatever but um there were there were a lot of like the Ivy Leagues were putting out free courses and still are I don't re was it Harvard Harvard has a computer class um I think US, MIT was yeah, putting out a good amount of theirs USC was doing it as well um and and I mean the resources are out there yeah. and higher education is um uh, they're 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 flipped on their end too. I mean, they've everyone's been out of class since March, um, and they've had to you know kind of re envision how they both offer class and justify why you should come to class. Now that we've seen this uh, this alternate reality through this forcing function. Well, yeah. So I mean, I've I've had talked previously uh, with you about the idea of be, have, class is could be something akin to like a Khan Academy or something that's posted on YouTube. So as a curriculum, everybody go watch your videos. They're doing that anyways. Um, and then school actually becomes a place where you get the answers to the questions that you didn't quite or the concepts you didn't quite get during the video. And so mm -hmm. what that does is take the parents out of the loop from the making sure that you learned the right topic and puts it square in the hands of the educator who hopefully that's their specialty or they're more equipped to answer, you know, question X, you know, like, Hey, how do you multiply uh, exponents or something like that? Like, uh, you know, maybe you, you did poorly in math, so you don't even know what I just said, but the teacher should know. Right. Um, and then if you have to review all, I mean, your, your notes, everything is still there. Um, and so that our current situation seems to lend more to that dynamic as well. So, I mean, it's, I, I'm going to, it's going to be, I'll feel very sad if we somehow so rapidly regress in my opinion back to the way it's been done you know up up through this this past christmas where you know everyone's expected to be butts and see, like there's so much potential here that you could you know i mean my kids doing um virtual uh um tours of say like the, the m m's factory or something like that i mean you, that's not what I want to go to that. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, those kinds of things. I mean, and that goes back to what you asked earlier. Imagine, a imagine VR that, that you get to go on a tour of, of things, you know, you know, you can go see the Taj Mahal. Um, yeah, imagine that from a teaching perspective, what that would open up for you. Um, I think that's been the barrier to entry for, I'll, I'll say people in this industry, but I think more generally um, just the, the the education style that that um, we all generally prescribe to is that uh, you know you have to have this structured learning environment and you know you you introduce a concept and then you try it out and then you try it out on your own and then you're you know you're expected to have achieved some sort of mastery of it and frankly people don't all i mean it's it's no surprise and no secret that people don't all learn the same way so i think even going to college you know sitting in lecture you know and particularly in things like programming i, I don't think i can recall 10 lectures that i sat through in six years of college but I can recall just about every programming project that I, that I worked on because for me, that's how I learn by doing. So I think a lot of the learning resources that are available right now, especially 
the free ones are very much focused on coming up with a final product. I've always done really well with um, those kind of structured courses where you're doing the thing and you're iteratively adding to it and you're, you're evolving to, you know, add complexity and, and, and take up new concepts as you're going through it. Yeah. That's a lot of what what the Skillshare and Udemy and stuff does too. Yeah. And if you're, you know, if you're struggling to, you know, um, take, you know, take courses in, in, in this or any industry really, you know, try, try a different path. I've, we, we said it, I think, we said it a number of times at this point that from our perspective, we don't, especially if, if a new programmer comes on to our team, we don't ask, you know, where they went to school. We want to know what they've worked on lately. You know, what, what skills are you bringing to the table? Not, you know, where's your paper from? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, cause none of that matters. I mean, it's, I mean, we talked about it previously. It's, you know, what, what the pieces of paper don't mean anything. What, what can you bring to the table, you know, or how much, how much training up do we need to get you on a certain subject? You know, um, languages aren't special, uh, from that perspective, the concepts are, um, so that well, I think we, we've, we've been through two events in, in my career time frame that, um, are similar, obviously nothing is exactly like what we're dealing with now, but the dot com bubble of the uh, you know just shortly after the year two thousand, and then the, the two thousand eight nine ten ish time frame where we had the the recession in the United States. Well, there was global recession for that matter. Um, those those were two you know hard times for for most people, but uh, particularly for folks in this industry. Um, you know, what particular strategies can we apply that we kind of had to learn on the fly in, in those two events? Mm. I, I can honestly say I was insulated a lot from that. Um, I, I got a, a job as a government contractor, so they seem to be, um, you know, that, that seemed to be kind of insulate me from those type events. Um, that's a fair point, though. I mean, I think as a job seeker, you know, know your market, right? Know, know where, know who is hiring and know what they're hiring for and target your search accordingly. I mean, that's. Yeah. And I mean, I would say also, too, um, you know, not don't be afraid to leave your your home state. Um, you know, you don't have to. None of these none of these IT jobs are necessarily um, you have to be at your home to, to, to do them. Uh, you know, some of them offer a remote, um, but you know, if you're in a small area, you're limiting yourself by what's available to you. Yeah. The 20 mile radius search for yeah. jobs. So, um, you know, you can, you can probably start throwing that away. I mean, I've even seen, I haven't been on a job search board in a while. But uh, I've seen some where they've said, you know, remote work is, you know, a, a top line checkbox. Even when we're when we're hiring, yeah. that's uh, one of the criteria that we have to include is, you know, we're that's something that we we're open to for for employees. Well, yeah, even look at, you know, when we are hiring, how many applications we get that are not within yeah. 200 miles. Yeah. of our location. Yeah. I mean, we got them yeah, you, from all over the country. Away, you realize, you know, like we were based out of Virginia, right? Yeah. yeah. When, when can you, you know, is that going to be a problem? No, I can be there on, on Tuesday. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. yeah. So, I mean, those are, I, I mean, you're kind of limited on you yourself or your own, I think limit. So, I mean, if you're, if you're actively like, Hey, I want a job and Hey, I'm, I'm willing to, um, you know, change, uh, what I've been doing to date. Um, those are going to be your two limiting factors. I mean, I don't think, I truly don't think that if you, if you are, um, like an air airplane mechanic or, um, just a regular auto, auto mechanic, I, I truly don't think that, a, a, an interest in IT or a career in at some type of IT path 
is beyond you. Um, it's literally like, hey, what, where am I looking? What kind of skill set do I need? And focus on that. I mean, Chris, you brought up earlier about where to go look. I mean, there's there's um, there's several different Google searches, and maybe we can include those in the description to try and find popular jobs or popular programming languages that would help you focus your effort. Because I mean, there is a lot. I mean, it is very it's a very deep pool and a very wide pool. Um, and so to help you focus in on something that would kind of put you at the top, you know, learning Java, learning C, those are two things that we talked about earlier. Um, yeah. And I think it's important to know your interests. Yeah. So I was, I, I was seeking a job right after the dot com bubble and, um, having had zero experience in the industry, you know, I was keen to take any job that basically said computer in the description. Mm -hmm. Um, and as such, you know, I started in a very non-traditional path and it took me a few years to get to the place where I was actually programming every day. Uh, but I also, you know, had that mindset of, you know, this is what I want to do. I'm, I can do a lot of things with the skills that I have. This isn't my dream job. This is my path to my dream job. And you got to eat that, that turd sandwich some days yep. and just, just keep pushing forward with it. But I mean, I think you bring a good point is, you know, if you, um, if you're really good at, um, visual things like, um, design and layout, you know, f start your search around, um, web development, right? So focus on, um, on jobs that, that have a high, um, high level of user experience and user interface and, and the, the, the more front end of things. If you're, if you're more interested in big data, data science, and like finding those diamonds in the rough, you know, that's, those are the, those are the ways that you want to tailor your search. And then, you know, there's no, there's no magic bullet for, for finding a job in, in ordinary circumstances. The, the truth is that people are still in need of people to work for them. You know, there's the, the work didn't disappear. Yeah. It's just the, the path to bringing in workers has changed. And to be honest, I don't think anyone has that fully figured out just yet. So you got to come in with the, the shotgun approach and just start trying all these different avenues. I wouldn't be shy about getting on LinkedIn, putting it out to your social networks to say, you know, here are the things that I'm looking for. Who do you know that might know somebody that can get me to the places where I want to go? If you have names of places you want to work, throw those out there, throw it out to the universe and see what sticks. I mean, they, how many degrees of separation are you away from every single person on the earth? It's, it's like six, right? Yeah. Something like that. So I mean, so if you throw it out there and, you know, a, you know, a third level contact might be at the company that you're looking for. I mean, that's half, that's half the population in the planet. Yeah. 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 Um, no, that's bad math. That's really bad. That's bad really math. bad math. <laughs> that's not good. math. <laughs> it, it would be, it would be an exponential step. It wouldn't be a, a linear step. God, idiot. <laughs> oh, you're fired. Yep. Yeah. So clearly not a, um, I'm only a math minor. So, so proof positive that, uh, you don't have to be a genius to, to no, do this also stuff. don't need to be a genius and you don't need to be <laughs> stellar at math, but, um, you know, the, the, the better armed you are with information, the better equipped you are for going out on the job search. Yeah. So, and, and you just have to really cast a wide net and, you cannot be shy about trying to get in front of people and getting the message out there that you're available for work. Well, well and one, this applies even more now than, than, uh, before or after, but it's, it's, um, it's just something that you, you, you're gonna really have to focus on in this time where you can't go knocking on doors. Well, to add one, one more little nugget, um, you know, no one says you have to go work for anybody. 
maybe you've identified some deficiency because of all this stuff. I mean, I see a lot of, a lot now that people are making masks and stuff. Um, you know, there's, there's, I'm certain there's a whole new industry of something that has just popped up because of this being shut in. I mean, I, I know all those, uh, those companies that do, uh, uh, food deliveries. I believe, I, I believe I saw some stat that they've increased, uh, their food deliveries by something like 500%. Now you can't predict those things, but you can see like, Hey, this, this is going to be a thing now. Um, you know, maybe you're looking around and going, Hey, that's, I didn't used to do that anymore. So it could be, it could be something as simple as you identified a deficiency in the system that maybe that you don't, you don't quite know how to articulate or say, Hey, you know, how many, how many times have you seen something like, Hey, I, I wish that would change. Well, <laughs> this might be your shot to change it. Uh, depending I would on what say, it is. Yeah, of, of all the times I've, I've, I've been alive of all the times I've been alive. Yeah. Uh, in my many lives now, the society has pivoted faster and further than I've ever seen it. Um, in you know, in all my years. Yeah. And you're right. I think that'd be even a, a great, uh, full episode we could do on entrepreneurship and scratching an itch that you you've identified and you know, what's, how do you, I mean, it's hard. I'm not gonna lie. I'm, I'm doing it myself every day, but it, there it, it is possible. And, you know, plenty of people have done it and continue to do it. And, um, if ever there was a time to be bold and to go after something, this kind of feels like it. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Any other sage words of advice? I mean, I would say, um, also I touched on this a while back, but, um, start looking at the open source community as well. Um, if you feel like you're, um, you know, you, you want that job in, in developing user interfaces, but you're, you're not sure that you are, 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 you know, fully qualified or the best candidate for that, find an open source project that you're, you know, that, that interests you and, and start contributing, pull down the source code. It's open source. You can do it for free. Pull down the source code, start reviewing it and learn from how they've done things and see if you can make a contribution and get involved. Um, the only thing it's going to cost you is your time, but it's, it's literally free education from people all over the world. And it also is a good habit to get used to looking at other people's source code. If you're not doing that on a regular basis. Yep. Yeah. I can't, I don't think I can. I don't think I can add to that other than saying, yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> cool. I mean, it's, it, you know, I, I don't envy anybody looking for a job right now, but it's, like I said, it's not an impossible task and it's not, um, the, the jobs are out there. You just have to really change your strategy for trying to find them. And, um, the, the better educated and the better armed you are in your hunt, the, the more successful that you're going to be. Absolutely. Cool. Think we got it all. I hope so. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, this was for love of code where you can find us at forloveofcode.com. That's F O R love of code.com. We are on the YouTube. We are on the Twitter. We're on the Instagram, the Facebook, the LinkedIn, we are endeavoring to be everywhere where you can suck down a podcast. We are a work in progress, but we appreciate you joining us today. Uh, look for us on future episodes. And please uh, don't be shy about sending us some comments. We would love to hear what you think. And uh, we'd love to have you join the conversation. Until next time, be well, have fun. We'll catch you soon.